Good morning, church family. Wonderful to see all of you today. And for those of you joining online, Pastor Dan is uh, enjoying some much needed time on vacation. So I don't think we ever really, I probably shouldn't have even said that. There's probably something sacrilegious about saying a pastor taking vacation, but he's enjoying himself with uh, Nancy, and so I'm going to be sharing with you uh, this morning. And I'm excited to do so, as I say, I think every time, because I am actually excited to be able to be up here and to share with you, and uh, uh, hopefully that you will be encouraged and challenged as I have been uh, encouraged and challenged as I've been prayerfully working through what God's been laying on my heart. And, and really, I've been really involved with a lot of this stuff with uh, Pastor Mark and the other leadership here at the church as far as the, the purpose and direction of Chisholm Baptist Church and uh, you know, really trying to align ourselves more closely with Matthew twenty two thirty four, with 2 Timothy 2, 2, uh, and then the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And so this morning, we're going to look into Mark chapter 9 which is none of those verses. Why? I don't know, because that's where I think we should go. Um, No, I'm just kidding. But these are some verses that God has just, had laid on my heart, and they really do align well with our overall uh, vision and purpose and direction as we move forward as a church and as a body um, of believers. And I think that we need to be challenged in our walk with Christ, because... um, If we're to love God, love others, and make disciples, we need to do this kind of within two umbrellas of serving and growing. All right? So we have, I'm going to say it one more time, love God, love others, and make disciples. It seems repetitious, but this is really important for us, and this is really important as a church that we continue to work through this understanding. And today, we're going to focus even a little bit further down in the the steps of the road. And Pastor Dan preached Uh, And Pastor Mark preached here about a month ago on on some of these things. Uh, But what is some of the practical applications or or how do we live this out? And today I want us to focus on the serve arm of the two arms that we're talking about, growing and serving. And so the title of today's sermon is The Road to Greatness. Well, there it is. You wouldn't believe how long it took to find a sign that said the road to greatness and then had Mark 9, 33 through 37. I think it was Detroit. Center Detroit they had. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, We just have a really creative and wonderful administrator here that works at the church for putting these together. Uh, I like the 11-foot clearance, so you guys are all good. Everyone's clear to make it through this. No one's going to be hitting their head or not able to get through this. Uh, But we're looking at Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37, the road to greatness. And if our desire is to see Chisholm Baptist be great, then it boils down to you and I. Because Ecclesia, the church, is the people, right? The body of believers gathered together. And so that means you and I, we want to desire to be great. And like so many things, Christianity kind of has a polar opposite assessment or view of what greatness is. Culture says that your status or your cultural influence is what makes you great. Pouring yourself into yourself is what's going to make you great. Being number one is what is going to make you great. Coming out up on top is priority. And it was interesting, as I was visiting with some of our global partners, uh, kind of that American culture of, you know, first place, second, third, and fourth. And he said, you know, where we come from, there's competition. But in the United States here, like, uh, they were sharing uh, some time with us over the fourth, and there were some running races, and the first place winners would get, like, $3, and the second place would get $2, and so on. He goes, that's kind of a foreign concept, actually, for us. And in our cultures, they wouldn't give more of a prize to first versus second versus third. And so, especially, you know, money. You know, in the United States, we're all about handing out money for gifts for things like that. But it was an interesting perspective of the idea of of what we value as being first, second, third, our ranking. And the interesting thing is that this is not just an American ideology. This isn't just the American dream because there's actually other cultures out there that depending on what caste system you're born into, you're stuck there. 
And so there's families that are working their entire lives to either try and cleanse themselves of karma or whatever in hopes that in an afterlife they'll be able to come back and be in a slightly better caste system. And so their whole, fir- their, their whole focus is this, I need to work myself to try and get out of poverty or I need to try to get into a different cultural class system. And we're going to find out that this wasn't that far off when we look back at the life of the disciples. And the Jewish faith and the, 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 the idea of Judaism, that idea of being the chosen people had gotten twisted and changed. And the idea of status really became something important. No longer were they focused on the fact that they were chosen people. They thought that was their status. As opposed to the fact that, it, no, what made you great or set you apart was the fact that God chose you. It was God's work that set apart the status, not what they did. But after generation and generation and generation, we see their cultural system working much more towards a status system. And today, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you that this is true for us today. What makes you great is not what you do, but the fact that God chose you. And if you want to be great in God's eyes, he explains it really well here in Mark. And so let's jump into today's text, but first I just want to pray. Um, There's some heaviness on my heart, uh, just with family and some uh, uh, mourning that's going on, and so, um, yeah, I just want to be able to lay that before God before we start here this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, I pray today, Lord, that your word, not my words, would be able to just pierce our hearts, affect change in our minds and our attitudes and our actions, to give us a desiring and a longing for you, a passion to see your name lifted up and made great. Father, may we walk away today with a mindset of more of you and less of me. Father, just give me the words to speak here this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you want to grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 9, and we're going to start in verse 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest, and and he sat down and he called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and the servant of all. And he took a child and he put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So I want to bring us up to speed a little bit on these verses. We've just picked up after the profound period of time of public ministry and Jesus and his disciples. We had the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. We had Jesus walking on water. We had miraculous healings. We had Jesus preaching in the, in the centers of the cities and, and people would travel far and wide Uh, Some to be able to experience healing and others to hear what Jesus had to say. It was a large and massive public ministry. And here in Mark, we get a glimpse into an intimate encounter where he is now focusing in on the disciples. This is a private, not a public um, time between Jesus, a rabbi, and his disciples, his students. Now Jesus knows that they still don't completely understand what he is here to do and accomplish. And this is proven because he's repeatedly tried to explain to his disciples that he was going to be killed in an effort to complete his mission. He was going to experience the utmost humility of being stripped and beaten and flogged and uh, crucified on a cross. Utter humiliation. A sinner of sinners' death. But they didn't understand. So if we back up in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, uh, we read his, one of his earlier encounters with him. He says, And he began to teach them, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. He wasn't talking in parables. He was explaining this plainly to his disciples. And Peter, gotta love Peter, took him, Jesus, aside and began to rebuke him. Let's see how this turns out. Uh, But turning, Jesus, and seeing his disciples, 
he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And then we read again in Mark 9, 31, For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. Here again we see it in verse 32, But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask. I wonder why. You can just imagine. I don't know, Andrew, you want to speak up on this one? I want to talk. And Luke, how about you? You want to question this one? No. They had seen how Jesus had rebuked Peter. And they said, wow, well, we don't understand this. We're going to keep quiet. Maybe we're going to figure out and learn what's, what's going on. But the idea that Jesus was trying to teach was incomprehensible to the disciples. Even after explaining it to them twice, they didn't understand, they didn't get it, they couldn't wrap their minds around the fact that their King, their Savior, their Messiah had to be humbled and killed. Think about it. For the disciples, their religious leaders wore special clothes to set them apart. Their religious leaders, the people that they looked up to, the rabbis, the people that they equated as closeness with God, when they would tie, they would have a trumpeteer blow the trumpets so that everyone would know that they had given. When they wanted to show that they were humble and, and that they were fasting, they would take off their beautiful garments and they would put on rags and sackcloth and they would put ashes on their face. And then they would go and sit in public. They would sit outside the temple so everyone could see that they were humbling themselves and fasting. When they wanted to show um, how dedicated they were to prayer, they would go out on the, on the corners and they would say these long, eloquent, repetitive prayers so that everyone could see how dedicated they were to prayer. So in the disciples' minds, this is what they equated as closeness with God. Being set apart being a higher level, a higher caliber. So Jesus knew that he needed to break through this understanding in order to penetrate their hearts. This doesn't sound too far off from us, does it? In a culture of, look at me. Look at how many likes I have. Look at how many views my page has. Look at my success. Look at my status. Look at my accomplishments. Look what I've acquired. You think Jesus' lesson has any relevance to us today? I think so. So, I want to spend just a little bit of time walking through today's text because uh, we pick up the verse 33 with them traveling to Capernaum. And as they traveled, you can imagine this group broken up into pairs, kind of walking along, visiting amongst themselves. And as they're walking, they're kind of thinking... Boy, if this guy's the Messiah, this is the king. Oh, there's 12 of us. Wow, that's pretty good odds. There's probably a pretty good chance that when all this shakes out, we're going to have a pretty decent position within this new kingdom. Remember, to them, Jesus is the conquering Savior who's going to free them from Roman rule, settle the scores from generations of wrongdoings. And the disciples know that they're part of the inner circle. They're the A squad in their minds. And they're thinking about what their future positions might be. Now imagine, this is a bunch of 30-some-year-old guys walking down the road going, hey, this is, man, this, he's done miracles. I mean, he says he's the son of God. I mean, this is, this is amazing. And we're on the inside. I wonder what I'll get to do. I wonder what I'll get to do. Well, I'll get to walk on water. I mean, you, you can see them starting to puff their chests a little bit and starting to, to kind of look at each other and like, well, who's better? Well, I, you know, I'm part of the inner three. Well, you're part of the 12. And so there, there's this arguing going along as they're walking and Jesus hears this. And so Jesus confronts them. And he says, what were you arguing about? And what is their response? They kept quiet. See, they're learning. They learned their lesson. They're going to keep quiet. I don't want to open my mouth on this one. But also, they, they, they may not have understood Jesus' ultimate humility that he had to go through, but they knew and they had spent enough time with Jesus that 
thinking about what they were saying and arguing about, they were ashamed. They knew that that wasn't something that they should have been arguing about, who was going to be the greatest. They had seen Jesus' love towards others and servanthood towards others. So Jesus calls them over and he sits them down to talk about this. Now remember, in rabbinic times, this would have been the traditional posture of a rabbi teaching his students. The rabbi would go and sit down, and his students would sit on the ground in front of him. This was like the, I mean business talk. Okay, So when the disciples saw Jesus sit down, they knew, hmm, he's got something to say to us. And so he says, for those of you who want to be the first, you must be the last and the servant of all. Countercultural. And then he looked out and he found a young child. You ready, Owen? Come with me, bud. All right, let's give Owen a big clap because he's going to come up and be brave with us. So he took a young child and he stood him in front of everybody. And then he took the child and he picked him up. You're a lot lighter than Huey is. I had Huey, my nephew, and he's kind of about twice your size. And he took the child and he set the child on his lap. And right away, we're already crossing cultural divides. And he said, whoever accepts one of these in my name accepts me. And not just me, but the one who sent me. So why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus take a child and put him on his lap and then talk to his disciples. We have to remember that in, in Jewish times, children were the lowest of the low. The only thing lower than a child was a servant. And the reason for that is, is because the mortality rate was so bad back then, a child didn't have value until they knew they were old enough that they were going to survive long enough to be uh, a productive person. So in that culture, the children were the lowest of lows. And he said, whoever accepts one of these children in my name accepts me. Because he also knows that he's going to be sending out the disciples. And the disciples in their mind are thinking, wow, we're going to be great. We're going to be like important people. They're going to have to bring out the fancy purified water for us when we come to speak at their synagogues and, and all these types of things. And Jesus says, no, think of yourself as a child and a child coming to you to share in my name. And if you accept this child who's the low of the low, then, they will, then you accept me. And not just me, but the one who sent me. And also, as parents, when we give for kids and we serve for kids, it's a, it's, it's, it's a father, mother serving a child. Children don't repay us. You gonna, how much money do you have in your pocket? Do you have like $20? No? Do you have like $100? No, you don't? That's okay. Right? When we serve kids as parents, we don't expect anything in return. And so he used this as a very strong metaphor, and that's why I wanted to do it today, because it helps remind us of what Jesus did to be able to break these cultural barriers. All right, good job, Owen. Thanks. Let's give him a lot, round of applause. He was my, my pitch hitter. We had... Uh, I didn't realize, so yeah, Huey left during the, after the first service, so I thought, I need a kid. So I did just like Jesus did. He would have just grabbed some random child and brought him up front. So. But no one knows service better than parents. Because our, our kid, they, do they repay us? How many of you as parents have had, all right, uh, your, your, your son walks in and goes, hey, you know, mom and dad, I was talking with my brother. We really do see how much you sacrifice for our family, how much you work, what you do. So, so we got together and we did some talking. And you know what? We're going to take care of the mortgage payment for the house, okay? So you just rest, you relax. We'll take care of that. We appreciate all that you've done for us, the McDonald's, all those types of things. So we just want to be able to repay you. You laugh because it, it is. It's ridiculous. And we don't expect that as parents. We don't expect our, our children to repay us for our service to them in providing for them and caring for them and bringing them up. Now granted, we do want to teach them to be appreciative and thankful and maybe when they get a little bit older like Dylan, like they can start you know, pulling their weight a little bit more around the house and some bills maybe. 
But we don't just look for serving an influential person so that I can develop status. He's not saying, go and serve someone that you know you can get a kickback later on. He doesn't say, go and serve someone that's so people can see you and how you're, you're serving that individual. It's the grind and the everyday service of a parent. And when we fast forward to Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45, we're going to again see how incredibly difficult this was for the disciples to understand this concept of Jesus being the ultimate in humility. It says in verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. I think that's a little bold. Um, And Jesus says to them, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left hand in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptisms with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we're able. And Jesus said, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard this, they began to be indignant now at James and John. And and Jesus called them to him and said, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, they lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. So as we seek to love God and others and make disciples, we do so under this arm of service. And I want us to ponder two aspects of this. First one is that we should be serving from an overflowing of Christ in our lives. And second, we should strive to be serving within our gifting. So first, we should be serving from an overflowing Christ infusion, I call it. Right? Christ infusing every part of us, filling us up. And I want to break this into three categories. Now, I know there's exceptions anytime I try to break us into categories because there's such amazing diversity amongst all of us. But I would categorize uh, different bumps in the road, on the road to greatness as being those who are blind, those who can't see the road, who can't understand and see the boundaries of this road to greatness, those who are stuck, who understand the road, they're on the road, they're traveling the road, but they encounter something that's keeping them from continuing. And third, those who are empty. The gas tank is on E. So, if you're blind, then your eyes have not been opened by the Holy Spirit to the truth of Christ, and the road to greatness makes no sense. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. If your faith is not firmly rooted in Christ to where that veil has been removed from your eyes, then your takeaway from this sermon is going to be, I need to serve in order to be right in God's eyes. And I would say wrong. We do not teach a service faith. A faith based on works. Because Scripture and the Gospel do not teach a faith based on works. You first must humble yourself at the cross and admit our dependence on Christ. Experiencing this free gift of forgiveness that God offers by accepting Christ as your Savior is crucial step number one. If we try to get on the road without having our veil removed, we're not going to be able to see ditches on both sides and it's not going to make sense to us. Or we're going to have a warped understanding of what we're doing and how we're serving. If you're not sure about this transformation that's awaiting for your life and your heart, and this idea of service by being last doesn't make sense, then I don't want you to leave here today without talking to someone. Talk to myself. There'll be a deacon and a deaconess up front. 
talk to someone else in the church because that is the utmost importance. Understanding what it means to be bought for, or to be bought and to be adopted into a family of Christ. That's step one. You need the jar first before it can be filled. Second, I want to talk to those of you who are children of Christ, but like the disciples, they're kind of stuck. They're stuck in the mire and the mud a little bit, and you understand what the expectations are, but there's the pressures of, 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 of the culture and then our sinful desires, and it makes it difficult to see outside of ourselves. Your jars have so many holes that you're filling it, but you'll, you'll never reach the top. You're not being filled to the point of overflowing and you're wondering, where's the joy in your life? Romans 7, 6 says, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We serve because we're overflowing in Christ and this is where the bulk of the sermon is aimed at today, this category We need to be filling ourselves. We need to be connected into the body. We need to be growing in our relationships with Christ and with others and seeking that eternal joy. We need to be putting on the armor of God to fight against these fleshly desires. So how do we get unstuck? One way that I want to propose to you this morning is do you have these three people in your life? Do you have a Paul? Do you have a Barnabas? And do you have a Timothy in your life? Do you have a Paul? Do you have someone that's pouring into you? Do you have someone that's investing into you? It could be a, a, a pastor. It could be a, a Sunday school teacher. It could be someone else from the church that is coming alongside you and, and pouring into your life. Do you have a Barnabas in your life? A Barnabas is a close friend that can help hold you accountable. And I'd be willing to bet that many of you have close friends, but I would evaluate, are your closest friends people that are sitting next to you in this church? Or at least hold a a Christian perspective? Because many of us probably have very close friends, but if they're not aligned in their heart and in their thinking with Christ, they're not going to be able to hold you accountable like Barnabas. They'll be able to hold you accountable to the cultural perspectives. And we've already proven that that God's greatness and cultural greatness are two different things. So you may have a really close friend that's going to tell you, yeah, pursue that, pursue that, pursue that, pursue that, because that's what's going to help you be happy and successful and all those things. As opposed to a Barnabas that's going to say, hey, wait a minute, let's pray about this. What does it say in God's Word? Is that, should that be your focus right now? Is that your soul? Fo- you know, someone that can be true and honest with you, and that takes vulnerability. And that takes work for, for you to invest in relationships here at the church. And finally, do you have a Timothy in your life? And this is where we truly enter the road of discipleship. Do you have someone that you are pouring into? So this is when we're getting to the point of, now we're getting filled up and now I can start to be able to pour into someone else's life and be the encourager and the accountability person for someone else. If you can evaluate yourself and say that you have all three of these people in your life, you're going to be on a much better path to getting unstuck or getting over these road bumps on the path to greatness as we seek to serve in a way that honors, the God, uh, that honors God. And finally, those who are empty. These are the individuals that are giving so much that they never get to the point of overflowing. You filled a lot of the holes uh, in, your, in, your, in your jar You may even have the three individuals. You've got a Paul kind of pouring into you. You've got a Barnabas that's helping hold you accountable. And you've got a Timothy that you're starting to to pour into yourself. And you serve and you serve. But you've put a lot of taps in your jar. You know what a tap is? A faucet or a spigot. So I put a spigot over here. I'm going to open that up. I'm going to put a spigot over here and open that up. I'm going to put a spigot over here and open that up. And pretty soon it gets hard to fill this pot because we're pouring out in all these different directions. And I'm going to tell you, we like spigots. We like spigots over, over overflowing. Right? Spigots, we can put it where we want it. We can turn it on and off. We can adjust it. We can control it. But if we're 
so focused on putting spigots in our lives and serving in all these ways that we want to serve, oftentimes we're going to be missing God's greater picture for us. He wants us to be filled to the point of overflowing. And He may be leaning you one way and wanting you to overflow in this area. But God, I've got so many spigots going on right now. I'm doing this, I'm serving this, and I'm, and I'm doing all these different things. And all which may be great things. But God may be saying, wait, I want you to fill up. The other problem is, is I would be willing to bet that a lot of people that fall into this category of being empty are ones that don't have strong Pauls in their lives. They're the ones being Pauls. Pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, investing. And while that is fruitful and growing in our relationship, we need Pauls. Pastors need Pauls in their lives. People to pour into them as well. Some of you may find yourself here this morning as people who serve in the church a ton, but you're feeling anxious and depressed and asking God to just give you enough strength to get through this next assignment or next ministry that's going on. And then when that one's done, you're praying, God, just give me a miracle. Just oh, make our schedule work out and just give me the energy that I need to be able to accomplish this and to do this and to do this. But seriously, we need to balance this ever-pulling draw to either be so engaged in the world that we don't have time for God or that we're serving in so many ways and overlaying that our plan with God that we don't see God's desire for our lives. What if we focused on God and then also implemented healthy self-care? Go for walks. Be involved in creative hobbies or activities where you use your talents and abilities that God has given you all by having a God mindset. We never do anything without a godly mindset with that and looking for opportunities. Exercise. I have to admit, I not admit, I'm going to say, so I went last night to the gym and I worked out really hard. And I'm feeling it today. But I didn't want to be a hypocrite and a liar behind the podium and say, we need to exercise, and I didn't exercise. So I did yesterday night, and I feel terrible. <laughs> and it brings to mind Romans 7, 6. It says, but now we are... Re- oh, nope, sorry, wrong one. Colossians 1, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And I fill up my flesh, which is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. So church, I did it for you. Now, I, I thought that was a pretty good plea for you. So. But in all seriousness, take time alone with God. Be filled with his word. Worship in quiet alone between you and God and allow him to fill you. Experience rest and refreshment. Remember I preached about it before. God is glorified. His name is lifted up when we experience rest in the way that he designed it. Enjoy the walks. Enjoy what God has done in his creation to you so that you can be filled up. Because as Christians, if we believe the truth that our body is a temple and we're made in God's image, we sure do a lousy job of taking care of ourselves. The vast majority of us. We're so focused on... And why is that? Because we feel... We, we feel bad about it. Like, there's so many things going on. I don't have time to do this, or I don't have time to do that. We feel like we're in this spiritual sprint. But we're not. We're in a race. This is long term. Always be prepared. In all, seasons, all, in all seasons of life, the Christian life should not be a caffeine roller coaster of pounding energy drinks to power through God's work And then experiencing the caffeine crash and the burnout in ministry. That's not healthy. That's not what God desires for His church. God desires us to depend on Him for strength. And He desires that we take rest. Paul wrote in his letters, uh, in his letter Philippians uh, 4.13, I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Pray and ask God to give you strength only to accomplish His will of what He wants you to accomplish. God doesn't want us to conquer the world. He already did that. God has already conquered the world. He calls us to be obedient and faithful and loving. Love God. Love others. And then to share the news. Make disciples.
Hebrews 4, 9 through 11, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And finally, I want to mention quickly that we also need to focus on serving God within the gifts that he has given us. So many of us think of service, serving, oh, God. This grudge and this grind and like, oh, I got to wash dishes or I got to sweep or do I got to, I mean, goodness, this seems like something more for hell than rather than living a Christian life. But that's not God's desire or his design for work. He wants us to be filled so that we experience joy when we serve. We serve out of an overflowing of Christ through the giftings that he's given us. And the giftings are unique. That's what makes being part of a body of Christ so exciting. If you're an arm, you serve as an arm. If you're a nose, you serve as a nose wholeheartedly. As a pastor, I'm not immune to certain servitudes. If something needs to get done, we want to have a servant and a humble attitude. Nothing is beneath me to serve. But would it make sense for for me to pick weeds out of the parking lot all day instead of preparing a sermon or pouring into people's lives? No. And that's where we need to strike that balance. A CEO of a company out weeding the garden and not signing checks for his employees isn't fulfilling the mission or the call that he's there to do. But if we're all still willing to serve and pick up the slack, the body of Christ works together. Also, that Paul that's in your life, That's someone who points out giftings. That's someone who looks at you and says, you know what? You may not see this, but I see this in you. Can you be a Paul to someone else around you? Can you come alongside someone and say, you know what? I've really been praying about this, but I feel you're gifted in this area. How can you use that to serve the body and be a part of the church? So I want to close with this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Not everyone can be famous, but everyone can be great Because greatness is determined by service. God doesn't desire us to be famous. He wants us to be great. And as we're getting ready to leave and head out for the week, I want you to ask yourself, here's some little mental questions that I want you to ponder as you leave here today, thinking about, am I on the road to greatness? Because God said you need to be the servant of all. So ask yourself, how many times this past week did I serve somebody outside of my family? Ask yourself, how many times this past week did I serve um, someone by by giving or or sharing the, the resources that God has given me? How many conversations this this past week did I have that I didn't turn the conversation to me somehow? That I just focused in on that other person? How many times this past week did I do something purposefully so no one would see that I did it? So that I can save my rewards for heaven. Eternal rewards. Easy to say. Harder to do. But I challenge you with that. Ask yourself, this week, how have I gone outside of my circle, in my world? Because God desires us to be great. Church family, God has given us the road to greatness. Now, in our broken condition here on earth, it's often not going to be easy. But it will always be pleasing in God's eyes. So let's make Chisholm Baptist great by each of us pursuing the path to true greatness. Greatness in the eyes of God.